Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And we come to lift up our hearts to him this morning. And you'll notice that the first hymn that uh, John Stasser has chosen for this morning is Holy, Holy, Holy. Now that comes from Isaiah chapter 6. And I want to read the opening verses of Isaiah chapter 6. <coughs> to me. Isaiah 6 is a wonderful passage because it details for us the call of Isaiah to be a prophet. And God sends him. But before that, there is a vision of God appearing in his glory. And this is what Isaiah says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There are two wonderful contrasts in those words. First of all, you have seraphim, angelic beings singing, holy, 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 and then Isaiah says, I can't sing that. I'm an unclean. My lips are unclean. So you've got that, that contrast. But you also have another contrast, and that is that Isaiah sees two kings. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. King Uzziah was a, a sinful king, a king who got leprosy as judgment. But then Isaiah says, my eyes have seen, and I'll interpolate here, my eyes have seen the real king, the Lord of hosts. So from the one hand, from a human sinful king, Isaiah looks to the Lord and he says, there is the real king. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Let us sing then uh, 51 in Rejoice. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Oh. 
bow in prayer. We've been singing of your holiness, our God. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. Father, you are God. Holy Spirit, you are God. And Lord Jesus, you are God, yet one God. Three persons. And we come to you in worship today, thanking you for the ministry of each person in the Godhead. Father, before this world was, you set your love upon a people. And in time, you sent your son, the good shepherd of the sheep, to give his life for the sheep. And Holy Spirit, who brings new life, new birth, who sanctifies, who moves men to write your word, who illumines our minds according to your word, how dependent we are we upon you, our God, for everything, for life, for breath, for food, for health, for strength, in life and in death, you are our God. And even death cannot separate us from you. For you remember that the Apostle Paul said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And the Lord Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. And the apostle again said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, Father, we thank you that as we live today, we can know your presence by your Holy Spirit. And as we face that last enemy, we do so in the strength of the Lord Jesus who has conquered him, who has put him to flight. He said, now is the prince of this world cast out, he said as he went to the cross. And Father, it's in the light of your dealings with us and in the light of your law that we confess our sins. We have not done what we should have done. We have thought things that we should never have thought about. Lord God, our sins weigh heavily upon us and we bring them to you. We cannot bear the load, but we look to the Lord Jesus who bore the load for us. In his own body, he took our sins and he took them to the cross. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we know why, at least in part. It was because he was made sin for us, who knew no sin. That God poured upon him the judgment that we deserve. Father, we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the new life in Christ. And we pray today that as we worship you and sing and hear your word preached, that the Lord Jesus would be honoured and our minds and hearts would be taught and we would be moved in adoration and in praise for all the good that you've done for us and are doing and shall do. Father, meet with us in our needs. Some of us are struggling. Some of us are weighed down with pain. Some of us have emotional concerns and maybe we're going through spiritual battles as well. And we ask, gracious God, that you would tend to each and minister graciously to each and remind each that you are the hiding place, the refuge, the strength of your people, a very present help in trouble. And so we commit ourselves to you today as we worship you. Please accept the worship that we offer to you in the name of your beloved Son, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. We come to the uh, memory verse. And um, I want us to say it together, then I want to say a few things about the memory verse. It's uh, on your sheets, on your, and it's in Romans 1 verse 16. Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel... 
For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. So briefly, let me just say these things. Uh, Last week Alan went to the end of that verse and spoke about the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want to go to the start of the verse and I want to say something about I am not ashamed. Those words, I am not ashamed. Paul here is speaking of his absolute loyalty to the gospel of our Lord Jesus. He has total confidence in the gospel. He has a complete conviction concerning the certainty of the gospel, the message, the good news of salvation in our Lord Jesus. And Paul is a real model for all of us to follow in our day. Uh, Paul said similar things to the Corinthian church. He understood that there were some there who may have thought that the gospel was foolishness. And that word is used when he writes to the Corinthians. And you find that in uh, the first chapter of um, 1 Corinthians that uh, uh, Paul says that the ones to whom the gospel is foolishness, they're perishing. If the gospel is foolishness to you, then Paul says you are perishing. And to everyone who truly believes the gospel of our Lord Jesus, it is in fact for you the wisdom of God and it's the power of God. So Paul says that when he writes to the Corinthians. And I believe that's what Paul is saying here in the the book of Romans in chapter 1. Paul is glorying in the gospel. The news that Christ Jesus came into the world and gave himself for sinners and rose again. And with all my faults and weaknesses, I must say ever since the time of my conversion to Christ Jesus in 1958, I have embraced the words of the Apostle Paul in our text. In sport, in teaching, in my teaching life, In public discourse, I have made no apologies for standing with Christ and standing for the gospel. I recall a day at work in Lismore after I'd left home and I was working in a chartered accountant's office. And it was over the previous weekend that I came to the assurance that Christ was mine and that the burden that I was carrying had been rolled away and I had trusted in him. And I thought I must tell all my workmates in the accountancy office. How do I do it? In the eyes of some it may have been quite a brash move. But someone over that weekend had given me a little tract. Which I would not give out to many today because the theology in it isn't quite the theology that I would probably embrace today with my reformed understanding of the gospel. But at that time, I went into Cecil Ramsey's bookshop in Lismore, and uh, it was a Christian bookshop, and I bought 18 copies of The Reason Why by uh, R.A. Laidlaw. And I walked into that accountant's office on the Monday morning, with 18 copies and put one on each desk as I walked down the aisle uh, uh, where we're all seated in the accountant's office. It was my feeble endeavours to tell these people that I was a different person. I felt that I couldn't say much myself, but this could tell the story. I won't go on too long with that, but on that day, I must say, by the grace of God, I nailed my colours to the mast. There was an outcome within a week or two. Some were critical, some mocked, some wondered what happened to this cromity fellow who was playing A-grade rugby league in Lismore and uh, how would they accept the changed life of this fellow. But three fellows that I worked with about my age, David Crane, Brian Green and Noel Call, all approached me and said, tell me more. Brian Green, in a few weeks after that, 
profess faith in Christ. I'm not sure about David Crane, but he showed a deep interest and would come to church with me occasionally. Noel Call came to me with tears in his eyes and he said, I don't know whether you know, but my mum committed suicide yesterday. Would you come and pray with me and with the family? I've been a Christian for a day or so. I wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ from the outset. Yet I am aware that we're often put in many places where we're tempted to compromise our Christian testimony in family gatherings, in the workplace, in our neighbourhood. If you really believe that Christ died for you and took the penalty for your sins and bore the shame for you, how could you be ashamed of him? How could you be ashamed of him? And Neil and I were speaking a day or so ago about Polycarp. And uh, he was a famous bishop in the early church. And he was being roped to the stake to be burnt as a martyr at the age of 86. And they gave him one last chance to denounce his faith in Christ, to renounce it. And what was his response? He said, 86 years I have served Jesus Christ and he's never done me wrong. How could I do wrong now? And that's the situation that you and I face as Christians in today's world. Will we renounce him or will we embrace his testimony and proclaim him? Now I'll finish with this. Some of you may have the book Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, I just want to read a few words from that as I finish. This is a lesser known man, John Lambert. And Todd Stanton mentioned him in one of the recent editions of Evangelical Action. On November the 22nd, 1538, Lambert was burnt at the stake in, at London's Smithfield for heresy, though he wasn't really a heretic. You see, Lambert didn't buy into the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. That the bread and the wine turned into the actual body and blood of Christ at the words of the priest. He didn't believe that. And for that he died. Christ was too precious and the meaning of the cross was too important for him to compromise. For Lambert, his own life was counted as nothing for the sake of Christ. In fact, according to the records, the manner of his death was horrible, and I will not go into the terrible, terrible details. And as he was burnt at the stake with two spears piercing him, he cried out to the people these words, None but Christ! None but Christ! What a cry, what a commitment. None but Christ! He was not ashamed of the gospel. My friends, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Because if you are ashamed of the gospel, listen to Jesus' words in Luke chapter 9 and verse 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Take those words to heart. Let's read the text. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And so I went through Rejoice Hymn Book and didn't find what I wanted, but found it in Christian Hymns, uh, the book that I know Alan has and Neil has and Kath has, and it's on your sheet. You should have it as an insert in the, um, in the bulletin. Jesus, and shall it ever be a mortal man ashamed of thee, ashamed of thee whose angel, who, who's, who angels praise whose glories shine through endless days. Let us stand and sing these words. Yeah.
Testament reading each Sunday. We read uh, Isaiah chapter 58. It commences on page 734 of our church Bibles. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 58, reading from the beginning on page 734. Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments, they delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes unto him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? when you see the naked to cover him 
and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you should be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. And you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honourable, if you wander it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And may God add his blessing to our reading of his word and give us understanding of it. Will you join with me now as we come and pray again and especially pray for some of our own concerns and things that affect us as individuals and as a congregation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how well you know us. Far better than we know even ourselves and know our own hearts. Search and know us this day. Try us, we pray. See if there be any wicked way in us. Lord, we confess that we at times go our own way, making our own choices, and we depart from things that uh, we know that we should, should not do, and we omit to do things that uh, you have commanded us to do. Forgive us and accept us. Be gracious to us at this time. There are among us those who are concerned uh, with health problems, with the other concerns of families, uh, with all sorts of things that uh, arise for us as individuals and as families. Lord, help us to cast our cares on you and to know that you will sustain us. You are able to strengthen and to bless. As in the past, you have brought us through various uh, times of difficulty, so we believe you will do yet again. Go with us, we pray, as individuals day by day, and uh, as we have already started this week, may it be a week where we're conscious of your, your blessing and your presence. As we pray for ourselves, we pray for us as a congregation. As we meet later uh, to make our formal decision regarding moving across to Barwon Heads. Uh, we pray for your presence and blessing. We pray, Lord, uh, that you will accept our thanks for the times of blessing that we have known here in this building, uh, these five years that have passed, and uh, we thank you for what you have done in that time. Help us to look forward uh, with, with confidence and with expectation. Uh, that as in your providence we are to move to another site for our activities as a congregation, that your blessing will be with us. And that it may even bring us into contact with people that we've had no opportunity to, to reach with the gospel here uh, in, in Wallington. We ask, Lord, that you will uh, continue to be with us. Uh, thank you for uh, all the members of the session and board uh, for their activities. Uh, we pray for all the others who uh, take part and who contribute so much uh, to our life as a congregation. May that continue and may we be built up even further in the things of the Lord and to grow and to love the Lord Jesus even more deeply. 
as we pray for ourselves, we pray for the, uh, the wider church. Lord, may in these difficult times for us, uh, the message of the gospel still go out clearly. Uh, help churches in what they're doing to uh, minister to the communities in which we live, uh, that they may see Christian people who uh, believe in God's providence and are uh, happy to, to live in these present times knowing that your hand is with us. Uh, make us, we pray, uh, testimonies to others, uh, that people may see us and recognise that, that our trust is in the living God. Be with us this day as we worship you. Uh, open our hearts to uh, the word of the gospel. Uh, we pray that uh, John will be blessed himself as he proclaims your word and we may listen uh, with spiritual understanding and that we, we may respond with joy uh, to the word of truth. So be with us, we pray, and accept of us now, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now a lovely hymn, uh, 507 from Rejoice, O Christ in you my soul has found, and we'll take our offering in the early part of the hymn and stand for the last verse. Hymn 507. Father, how we bless you for the truth of the words that we have just sung, that none but Christ can satisfy, no other name will do, there's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus, found in you. And help us, we pray, to respond to that love by giving ourselves afresh to you. Take us and use us in your church and kingdom, that the gospel may be brought to others and that people may see within us the change that the Lord Jesus can bring. Bringing people out of darkness into light, breaking the bonds and fetters that bound them to Satan and bringing them into the freedom of the gospel. So accept us 
and accept our monetary gifts for the work of your kingdom. And we pray it all through Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Let's open God's word this morning to our passage in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians will finish off the third chapter, taking up the reading at verse 11 and continue through into chapter 4. This is the word of God. Let us give our attention to it. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honour. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you for God has not called us for impurity but in holiness therefore whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gave his Holy Spirit to you now concerning brotherly love you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Let us pray. We thank you for your word, O oh our God. We bear testimony as we gather under that word that it is indeed a light to our path. Through that word we have gained wisdom. You have instructed us you have strengthened our faith, you have guided our lives, and you have helped us to have an answer to give to those who inquire about the hope that is within us. Even the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, making him who is our saviour and our king known to others. Continue to bless that word to us as we gather together Help us to be attentive. Help us to not understand, not only to understand the text, but to apply it. May your Holy Spirit convict and confirm. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever noticed the oddity of walk? in the Olympic Games. The sport 
known as walking. Can you imagine anyone walking down the street like they walk, kilometre after kilometre in those races? I don't mean to criticise those who take up the sport. I, I recognise it's very demanding, uh, that participants need to be very fit and determined. They need to be aware of and follow the rules and pursue the right aim. And I think as we consider those, uh, as well as with any other sport, there is much that we could and perhaps should keep before us as we live the Christian life. But what particularly strikes me about sport walking is that it stands out as different to life walking, to the way that we walk day by day. That's why I called it an oddity. It's not so much a, a refinement or an enhancement. It is something totally foreign to the way that we walk day by day. And I would put it to you that that makes it a very fitting and powerful illustration of the Christian life, which significantly in the Bible is described as a walk, and yet also as a race. Here in the Bible, walk is a powerful image for the, for the nature and the direction of one's life as a Christian, of one's daily conduct, for the Christian to walk in Christ means to walk according to the pattern that he set before us. A pattern which is consistent with all that God through the Holy Spirit has revealed through the word of God. Since the overwhelming majority of people live as though life were complete with, without God... That makes the Christian walk then, which is centred so much upon God, and according to his word, his rules, it makes the way that we live, our walk, look like an oddity. To the world, the Christian is eccentric. Increasingly, the way that we live stands out from the accepted norms of how to live in this world. We seem to walk awkwardly. The people of this world see, see nothing of the balance, the energy, the speed, the benefits of the walk that we call the Christian life. This reality, however, should not deter us from the Christian walk. And its special character of that walk is what Paul wants to address here as he uses what for many preachers is an infamous word. And we were warned at theological college, be very careful in the use of this word. Finally, it should signal to most in the congregation, oh, a couple of more minutes to go. <laughs> the last gasp of teaching. But for many preachers, it's a recharge. <laughs> Paul here does not use it in that sense of this is just a wind down. Paul is saying, this is what I really wanted to get to. I've talked to you about the wonders of God's grace and how it has transformed you. Now, finally, I want us to talk about the practical nuts and bolts of what that looks like. And he takes as many chapters to do that as he did to get there. Finally, Paul wants to talk about what it means to live as Christians in an alien world, where we are at best eccentric in the opinion and mindset of the world. He addresses in these chapters the big issues of life which can be described as sex, work and death. But underpinning all of these is the realisation that we approach them differently because of the grace of God at work in our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are different and so our walk will be different, ought to be different. Paul had already seen that they took seriously the implications of the gospel. 
They were not ashamed of Christ. And they showed that by turning away from the idols that they had served. And their neighbours and family members continued to serve. They separated themselves. They began to live differently. Paul is not challenging this. But what Paul is concerned is, is that they develop this. That they work it out more and more. And there are questions that Christians face. How do I apply the gospel in this new area that I've, I've never thought about before? What does it mean to follow Christ in this context? Or in this particular time of my life? Where there are challenges and changes. Paul's concern is that they would continue to walk the Christian life. And that they would do so, he says, more and more. Listen to him in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is doing here is setting the scene for the remaining chapters as he talks about the Christian life and what it means to be a Christian in today's world. And he stresses here three life basics which characterise the walk, which characterise our Christian life. He says it is a walk, it is a life, first of all, that is compelled by love. Now you might say, John, how do you get that out of these verses? There's no mention of love. But there is the demonstration of love. Notice how he comes alongside them and calls them brothers. But notice even more that he asks and urges them. To keep on living the Christian life that Christ has set them on. There's something vital to notice here. The apostle does not come with apostolic authority. He does not come with the rod of commandments. With the, 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 the rod of authority. Though in the next verse he does mention that they are under Christ's command. And that he has taught them Christ's commands. They know how they ought to walk. And by that he is indicating that Christian uh, life, Christian practice comes under Christ's command. It's not left up to individual preferences or cultural dictates. But Paul doesn't come with the heavy hand. He comes as a brother to his brothers and sisters. He comes with affection, with Christian affection. And he comes with an exhortation to persevere and to extend their Christian life in line with what he has been teaching them. This is in line with the relationship between love and holiness, which previously we looked at at the end of chapter 3, where we saw there that holiness is... It's not only something that God pursues in us because he is the thrice holy God. But holiness is that which comes out of love and cultivates love. The Christian life, if you like, is, is, is driven by love. It's controlled by love because it's grounded in love. It's the spring from which it flows. You will not know holiness apart from love. And a pursuit of holiness apart from love always results in legalism. And we need to see what Paul is doing here. He is speaking as one, yes, about Christ's commands, but he's doing it out of a context and in a spirit of love. He's proclaiming the truth, but in love. He genuinely cares for them. And that's how Paul is describing his actions here, his approach to them. He wants them to know his love for them. He 
Is that what it's like in today's church? Is that what it's like in your experience over the years in the life of the church? That people come or that you yourself are ready to, to point out an area that people need to at the very least improve, if not repent? Do they come as brothers with a gracious, prayerful wisdom, a tenderness and an affection that shows a genuine concern that has caused them with a breaking heart to talk to you or you to them about these things? I fear there is a tendency in all Christians to come across as self-righteous know-it-alls. We live in such a way that, that our walk seems to have more an air of judging than loving. And people are put off. They won't listen to our lives as a result, let alone our words. How we really need the Holy Spirit to make us squirm when that becomes true of us. Paul was a Pharisee before he became a Christian and the last thing he wanted was that air of judgmentalism brought on into the Christian life. And he's being very careful here. And the Word of God is asking us as we live out biblical principles and seek to see others do the same. Is love for another real and obvious in what we are doing? Can others see an underlying warmth to our godliness? A warmth to God and His Word, to the Saviour and His, His mercy? Can they see a discernible meekness in us? as well as a humility before them in seeking their good? Can they see compassion in how we draw near to a sinning brother or sister? It doesn't mean that we remain remote. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't speak when someone needs to hear something about their lives. What it means is that we give much more prayerful attention to what we are thinking they need why they need it, how they will respond to our approach, whether it is our approach or the Holy Spirit using us. We need to give more, un more prayerful attention to understanding God's word and to our manner as we dare to speak to one another. No wonder in Galatians 6, Paul says, let the wise, let the mature among you if you see your brother in sin, be very careful about how you address them. Is our Christian life compelled by love? Secondly, is it constrained by duty? If we return to the image of the sport worker, we know that it is governed by a very strict code of practice and that the participants need to give great attention to the rules that as you watch this sport in the Olympics, how quickly and, and readily it seems the flags of disqualification go up. It seems more than in any other sport. Because it is so contrary to the normal way that you want to do things. You want to break into a run. So, so your gate changes and the flag goes up. They practice and practice until it becomes second nature. But then they have to remain watchful lest they are disqualified for, for breaking their walk. As Christians, we need to be reminded that our life is not a free-for-all. That we can do as we like. Oh, the wonder of God's grace that the power of sin is broken and we are free from the, the, the pollution and the, and the burden of sin. The guilt of sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we are not free to act as we like. As if there is no longer such a thing as sin. Listen to the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 8 verse 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. 
That's a wonderful freedom that we have through Christ. A wonderful freedom in this life. And only beginning to imagine the escalation of what that looks like in the life to come. Yet Jesus also says in John 14 verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commands. You will keep my commandments. You see, conversion to Christ binds us over to a life of obedience. And so Paul reminds them, not only did he give them the gospel, but describe the life that flows out of knowing the gospel. Not only bringing the, the wonders of God's grace through Christ to them, but the wonders of God's grace described in their daily lives as a result. He is saying here in this passage that there are rules. The way is governed by the instructions of Christ. Some translation put commandments there. And I actually think that's a better translation. The original word is a military word. It's a commander talking to his troops. Let's have a discussion. Should we do this? Should we do that? Not on your life. The commander instructs. And it's a command. It comes with authority. And what Paul is saying in using this and speaking of Christ's commands is that the word of Christ comes to us as a matter of duty, not of liberty. If you come to Christ as Saviour, you are not called sometime down the track to bow before him as Lord. You cannot have him as Saviour if he is not your Lord. Because he has told you where your life has gone amiss and where forgiveness is to be found. And it is through his death alone, acceptance through his life alone. And that means that you accept him as Lord over your conscience and Lord over your life. Hence the word Paul uses, ought. How we ought to walk. And his point here is that these rules are constant. There is no variation or change in them. What he will tell them is the same as he has already told them. He's just fine-tuning the explanations or the implications. How to apply them in new contexts or situations or in light of questions that either they were asking or he knows that Christians inevitably begin to ask at different points in their lives. You know, the way that Christians live today in comparison to former generations might make you wonder whether or not the law of God... The commands of Christ have changed. But it ought not to be like that. This verse is a declaration of the authority of Scripture, of the permanence of Scripture and the sufficiency of Scripture. The rules don't change with changing circumstances. What you need is not fresh revelations from the Holy Spirit. What you need is fresh instruction through that Lord, the Spirit, help in coming to terms and understand not only that, the, the, the law of Christ, but the application of that law in changing circumstances. But even more than that, that these are rules that need to be adhered to. He says in verse 1 that this is how you ought to walk. He's writing them to them about the walk which they ought to walk. That it is in this they are to abound more and more. In other words, it's a lifestyle that should become more and more apparent, more and more energetically pursued, more and more natural to us, over which we are watchful, but in which we delight. To love the Lord is to love his revealed will and to be committed to it. And so people who want to be followers of Jesus must take what he says, what the Bible teaches, seriously. Not just on selective topics that appeal to them, but even when it grates against their preferences and prejudices and 
previous conclusions of how one ought to live or act. We need to understand what Paul is saying here is that the failure to do this and to increasingly be like this is tantamount to treason against King Jesus. It's to reject him. And that's at the essence of sin, isn't it? And sin still occurs in the life of the Christian. So we need to be watchful. We need the law to guide us, but also to constrain us in the way in which we walk. And finally, to be consumed with God. Again, as we think of the sport walker, the aim of the walker is clear, isn't it? It's to finish, and if possible, to win the race. This drives them on. It shapes everything they do. Their training, their actual walk, their perseverance in that walk, their watchfulness. You see... They know the rules, but it's not the rules that drive them. It's the glory at the end. Now that may be proving to themselves or to another their capabilities, their achievements, that they can do it. Or the pleasure that they get or give from doing it. And the question comes, what's our aim in the Christian life? It's not the rules that rules be kept. Though sadly many Christians being so concerned and, and rightly concerned to do the right thing that they fall into the trap that the rules are everything. No, we don't kick out the rules. Yes, we do honour the rules. But the rules are not an end in themselves. The rules are not what we bow before. But before our God who has given us these rules. That's the difference. The failure to keep aware of that difference will result in a harsh and cold lifestyle. A lifeless faith that is unattractive to others. But Paul says the right motivation is this. To please God. To please God. That's the sum of Christian motivation and, and Christian duty. That the Christian life is very much God-centred living, as he stresses also to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10.31. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's not about you. It's not about your neighbour. It's not about the rules. Though you, neighbour and rules all have their place, it is about God. The overriding purpose of the Christian life is to glorify God. Everything we say, everything we do, the relationships that we, we have with others, the use we make of gifts as well as of opportunities that God gives us, even our enduring under adverse circumstances and human hostilities, must be managed so as to give God honour and praise in how we live. Praise for his wisdom. Honour for his goodness. So Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The object is not completely doing good works. It's so that your neighbour will see, but more that they will glorify your Father in heaven. And that's not only the duty of the church, it's the personal calling of every Christian, of each one of us here now, to please God. Is that why you live the Christian life? Is that why you're interested in the Christian life? Is that why you see coming to church on the Sunday as an important part not only that God has called us to worship him, but it is the very means that he honours to build us up in our faith and to guide us in our walk, that it is to please God. When you pick the clothes that you decided to wear today, the temptation is to look good. Let's face it. But that's not why we're coming here. 
We are conscious of one another. And God has created us to be aesthetically sensitive and sensible towards one another. But as we do all of this, it is to glorify God. To please Him. And that has an orientating effect on how we view God's authority and God's law and how it is worked out in the practice of our Christian walk, our daily life. We discover that the eye is not on the letter of the law, as important as the law is, but the author of the law, who gives it its importance. It's seeking to please him that suddenly the law turns into a delight. We don't have time this morning, but go back to Isaiah 58. They had an external obedience to the law, to the law, but the Lord of the law basically is saying you didn't care about me in the way that you kept the externals. And you had no delight in me because you had no real delight in my law. What makes the law as a whole a delight is that it is an expression of who God is and of his intimacy, his compassion, his mercy toward us. That's why Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And finally, it clarifies, doesn't it? When we live to the glory of God, it clarifies. Pastor, what should I do in this situation? The Bible is not absolutely black and white clear. We know the general parameters, but how do I make a decision? It is this truth that brings clarity to confusion. The question I would ask you, how can you best glorify God in how you walk? Let us pray. Oh, give us grace, Father, that we would more and more try to please you rather than ourselves or others. And that we would be confident to become increasingly different from those who do not know you. Being unashamed of Christ or his word. That when the question is asked, how then shall we live? The answer comes back with resounding praise. As Christ. For Christ. By Christ to the glory of Christ. With Christ alone in him alone and always give us such grace in Jesus name Amen our closing praise this morning is 285 in rejoice 285 how blessed the righteous in their life who from God's law do not depart, who holding fast the word of truth seek him with an undivided heart. 285.
Let us then go forth into the life that God has called us, knowing his grace rests upon us. And now may the grace, mercy and peace of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.